Well, special thanks to all our musicians this morning for giving to us the opportunity to be blessed and to be able to take part in the singing today. What a, what a joy and what a blessing uh, it is. And uh, to be able to, to celebrate as we look forward to this week, VBS, uh, that's, uh, that's just a really a neat time. And I'm just praying for these young people that will come and, and take part and praying for their salvations and uh, just the blessings of this week. Because of VBS, we will not be having our Wednesday night Bible study this week. So you'll have to wait until a week from Wednesday night till we can get back together again and get into uh, our sixth lesson out of 10. So uh, that's what's happening this week. So I trust that you'll be able to take part. If you need a Bible this morning, we are gonna be in 2 Thessalonians. And uh, if you need a Bible, just slip up your hand. They'll make sure that you uh, get one if you wanna follow along this morning. Someone in the first service told me that, um, you know, with all of this background, uh, as I said to them, I said it would have been more appropriate for me to speak on Lazarus or Jesus coming forth from the tomb. I mean, I have all of these illustrations. We could have wrapped a teenager up in toilet paper and (laughs) told him to come forth from the grave, and that would have been an awesome time. But um, somebody said to me, they said, well, Pastor Kevin, you ought to call an audible and just go on to a different passage of Scripture, but I'm I'm not able to do that mentally. (laughs) So um, we are in 2 Thessalonians this morning, and I I hope that it will be a blessing to you as we as we look at this passage of scripture, one of the things that, that stands out, I think, is um, it, it may be simplified in some ways by saying this, but our salvation is, is really the core of our joy. It really is what is so important to the focus of our life. And we sometimes can lose sight of the fact that we are saved, especially if it was years ago that you placed your faith in Jesus Christ and now you come to that point and you, you say, well, I'm, I'm doing this and, and we get so sidetracked. We forget the simplicity of the faith and the moment that Jesus Christ changed our life forever. The Bible talks about the first love of the Christian back in Revelation. In fact, one of the churches is, is noted that they've lost their first love. Could that be that they've lost their love for Jesus Christ or is it speaking of the time when they first came to faith and everything was so, so exciting because they were blessed by the fact that they were on their way to heaven? Well, I think both of those interpretations have some merit uh, to them. Without a doubt, it's easy for us to forget uh, the blessing of our salvation and be able to, to really take comfort in that. The title of the message this morning is Jesus, uh, the source of comfort and strength. When you come down to the last verse in chapter two, you'll see it's mentioned there um, in the last couple verses, the word comfort is given to us in a couple different places. And I believe that the design here by the Apostle Paul is to bring comfort to the Thessalonians, that they would realize that they have so much to be thankful for and they would be so blessed by the reality of their salvation. When we look at this passage of scripture though, we see that there's a lot going on. And I would have to back you up there to verse seven where it says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, that Satan is seeking to confuse the world and blind the mind of individuals. But I pray this morning that we'll be able to find Jesus indeed is the comfort and strength that we so desperately need. Let's look to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Ask him to bless this passage. God, we give you thanks for truly you have made the way for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And it's only by faith in Jesus that this is possible, but we're so thankful, Lord, that you loved us enough to give us Jesus Christ. May you bless the word of God this morning. May it speak to our hearts. May we have understanding of it, I pray in Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Well, this Bible passage of Scripture talks about the fact that this lawlessness is already happening. That if we looked around us, we would see the mystery of lawlessness is at work, but the one who's restraining will continue to do it until he is taken out of the way. Two weeks ago, we noted that the one restraining must be the Holy Spirit that Paul is speaking of. For the Holy Spirit truly is through the lives of believers holding back sin. We know that we are to be as the church of Christ, we are to be salt and light in the world in which we live. But there is coming a time where the church will be taken up to meet Jesus Christ in the clouds. This is a reference to the rapture, as I understand it. And if I can get my thing here to work, we'll be in good shape. 
there's a little tribulation map, they call it. You'll see right at the very beginning that there's a reference to the rapture of the saved. It's at that point in time, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 describes that event, and that's when the church will be caught up to be with Christ in the clouds, and we will be effectively removed from this world. What follows is seven years of tribulation, where you see the wrath of God being poured out upon a world that has rejected him. Now, it's important to note that immediately after the rapture takes place, there will not be any believers on the earth. They will all be caught up with Jesus Christ in the clouds, and there is some of the things that we'll be doing during that seven-year period of time that's unique to the church. There is, however, many people who have never heard, I believe, the gospel of Jesus Christ who will be saved during that seven-year period of tribulation. We stop and we think about how God is working and we see how Satan himself is seeking to work. These two forces coming and opposing each other. You'll notice here in our passage that it says, that is, speaking of Satan, he says his ministry of sorts, if you want to call it that, is to deceive. It says, then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and wonders. Satan is alive, and he is at work in the world today. Uh, Everything that Satan is trying to do is trying to blind the minds of individuals so that people will not place their faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the God of this world, small g, is blinded the minds of individuals. But this is not the end story for the devil, for this antichrist, this satanic being, will be destroyed. Take your Bibles and go back with me to the book of Daniel, if you would. Because in Daniel chapter 7, a passage that we just got through studying this past Wednesday night, we have a description there of a person by the name of the Ancient of Days. And that's no other than God the Father who is being mentioned. For the Ancient of Days is the one who took his seat and his vesture is like white snow. And it goes on and it describes the holiness of God the Father. And he tells us here that in verse 13, I kept looking and in the night visions, behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. Uh, that all the people, the nations, and the men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. That reference there is a reference to God the Father, the Ancient of Days, committing to his Son, Jesus Christ, the judgment that will come upon this world. And Christ, in the end, after the seven-year period is over, will return. That's the second coming of Jesus Christ. And you'll note that green aspect there at the end of this map. It's a reference to the kingdom. That is the 1,000-year millennial kingdom that Jesus Christ will preside over. And that kingdom, my friends, goes right into the eternal kingdom, and there is no end to that kingdom. Satan may think that he's got it locked down. He may think that the Antichrist, who's the head of this earthly kingdom that is so anti-God and so anti his saints, will somehow triumph. But alas, it is only a temporary kingdom. It will meet its demise. And that is what Paul was talking about there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Back here in Daniel chapter 7, it's described here that this one, this Antichrist, is waging war with the saints and overpowering them. And in verse 22, it happens until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. On down further in this chapter, it describes the Antichrist who's one who will speak out against the Most High and wear down the saints of the highest one and he will intend to make alterations in times and laws for three and a half years. But notice verse 26, but the court will sit. And in in italics it says the court will sit for judgment. This is the heavenly court. This is where God's verdict will be passed down. You see, the court will take its place, i.e. God. 
and Jesus Christ, and they will take that seat. The court will be convened, and the verdict will be passed down, and the Bible says his dominion will be taken away, annihilated, and destroyed forever. And this is the demise that Satan and the Antichrist will face as God, who is the one true God, will come and bring judgment upon him. And the Bible says that after that happens, then the sovereignty, the dominion of the greatness of all the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one, and his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. That's a marvelous future that we have to look forward to, amen? amen? Those of us that are in Christ, we can rejoice that ultimately at the end of it all, the justice will be served, the righteous will triumph. There is very many reasons there for optimism and encouragement and comfort. But in the meantime, in the meantime, the adversary is at work. In the meantime, the ab adversary is doing everything he can in his power to cause the blinders to remain over the eyes of individuals in the world today. And because of that, there are many people who are refusing to place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. I think it's important for us to understand this enemy because he is truly a diabolical foe. In the book of Revelation, over in chapter 13, the vision that John receives there on the island of Patmos is most disturbing. In fact, I believe Daniel and John find it most disturbing when they're receiving these visions. In fact, Daniel chapter 8 says that Daniel literally physically becomes ill over the vision that he's receiving. So much so it takes him away from his work. He's not able to even function for a period of time. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1, John is there and he sees, standing on the seashore, the dragon, who previously in chapter 12 is described as Satan himself. In verse 2, it says there's another creature that comes up out of the sea. This is a reference to the Antichrist. And the Antichrist and Satan are working hand in hand according to this passage. For the Bible says here, and the dragon gave him, the Antichrist, his power and his throne and great authority. Understand that the enemy that we speak of is energized and backed by Satan. This, this is a plan that Satan has. Ultimately, the believers are gone at this point, many of them. The rapture's already taken place, and the Bible says that they will worship the dragon because he gave his authority or because he gives his power to the Antichrist. And in addition to that, they worship the Antichrist. This is what's happening. This is a, this is a very difficult time. And we go back to the passage here, we see that, that our adversary is is formidable in many ways. The working is incredible. Going back to 2 Thessalonians, you see that it's spoken of here, that this one who will be revealed at the beginning of the tribulation will, in accord with the activity of Satan, demonstrate power and signs and false wonders. And it's all done with the goal of deceiving the people of the earth with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. Satan is able, and he talks about the power here, it denotes the cause or the, the root of these miracles that are going to be done during this period of time. There's signs and there's false wonders. These are, these are abnormal, these are supernatural in the eyes of people. And it leads to their total astonishment. They can't believe that these events are happening. But ultimately, they are going to turn and worship this false Messiah. They don't do it, however, just because he's the reason for their hope. They do it because his philosophy agrees with their flesh. Because really what they want to do, he tells them it's all right to do. You see, in their life earlier, they were always having to face the reality of their conscience and the fact that there were truth-tellers in the world who spoke of the reality of righteousness and unrighteousness. But now all of those things are stripped away, 
and they can follow after their sin as they truly desired all along. Notice what he says after. He says this about this deception of wickedness. He says, they did this because they didn't receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. And he tells us at the very end of that verse 12, they didn't believe in the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. There's a desire among those in the world today and there always has been. Ever since you can go all the way back to the fall, there has been a desire for people to be able to do their own thing, sin in their own way, without any consequence. I believe this passage is linked over to Romans chapter 1. And I'd like to show you just a couple things here in Romans chapter 1 that that stand out to me as as I look at this. Because the big issue here as we understand the response of the Lord to this type of sin. It is a passage of scripture that's worth noting. It's something that is worth taking a look at. In Romans chapter one in verse 24, it says in verse 24, and if you like to to keep track, 24, 26, and 28, these even verses, it says, therefore God gave them over in the lusts or the desires of their hearts to impunity, impurity rather, He goes on and he describes some of the the wickedness. In verse 26, it says, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions. In verse 28, it says, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind. And so in three different places, you see that God is giving them over to their sin. Uh, It's important to note this in light of this next verse as we go back to 2 Thessalonians. Because this is a verse that's talked about quite a bit. And and in trying to understand the the response of the Lord, I believe that we see here that God honors their desires. In verse 13, it says, for this reason, or verse 11, for this reason, God will send send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, but took pleasure in wickedness. So imagine yourself during the time of the tribulation. I know it's something you don't want to imagine. And if you're a person of faith, you don't have to worry that you're going to go through that tribulation. I believe that the church of Jesus Christ is raptured as you see on that map. But there are people who are living during the time of tribulation who desire to pursue their own flesh and presume that God is not concerned about it, having placed their faith in the lies of Satan, they are now fully deceived. And they are headlong into their sin. It's at this point in time that you see that God's response to them is to send upon them a deluding influence. The tense that he uses there for the verb to send to them is a prophetic tense. And what that really implies is that there's an assurance to what is going to be expected and what's going to follow. There's not a question about this. This is, this is the reality. This is what's going to take place. God is not going to force them to place their faith in him. Instead, God sends them to them a working error. And that's the best translation that you can really get there. A working error that allows them to follow this lie. So they have this working error and they're following this lie. And God is saying, okay, I'm going to allow them to follow after their wickedness. And because of this, they will not turn to me for salvation. I think it's important for us to note that without God and his initiative, We don't come to a place where we place our faith in Jesus Christ at all. As Steve mentioned a a couple times this morning in his announcements, and he asked us to pray for the young people at VBS, he said, pray that the Holy Spirit would draw them and that they would ultimately be led to place their faith in Jesus Christ. That's actually a reference to John's uh, gospel, John chapter 6 and verse 44, where Jesus says, um, no one can come to me. No one can come to me except the Father who sent me draws them. And so we have the activity of the Father of 
pulling people towards himself. We also understand the Holy Spirit does convict. Holy Spirit brings conviction upon us. We see the working of God as people come to faith in Christ, and this is usually how it's working out, where you have the Holy Spirit at work, you have the love of Christ, and they're experiencing the love of Jesus Christ along with the Holy Father, drawing them to himself. And this working of God is so important to note. This isn't going to be what's occurring, though, during this tribulation period. I believe that there are people who will come and and place their faith in Jesus Christ during the tribulation. In fact, the Bible speaks about the tribulation saints who are up in heaven having been beheaded because of their faith in Christ. The Bible talks about 144,000 Jews who will go out, 12,000 from each one of the 12 tribes of Israel will go out into the world and evangelize and there will be many, many people who will come to faith in Christ during that seven year period of time following the rapture. And so we try to understand what the scripture is saying and my understanding, and I could be wrong, but my understanding is that people who are hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ today will not have the opportunity to place their faith in Jesus Christ even if they realize that the rapture that they refuse to believe in has occurred. I talk to people frequently, it seems over the years, where people would say, I'm not ready to place my faith in Jesus Christ. No offense, but I appreciate your telling me, but on my deathbed, just before I pass away into eternity, it's then that I'll pray and I'll call on Jesus' name. Usually there's a, some type of a, a negative because, well, you know, if I, if I get saved now, I'm going to have to give up this or I'm going to have to stop doing this or I'm going to, you know, you're going to want me to go to church on Sunday and, you know, and I like to do this. And, and, but at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll pray. I think there's also an understanding, it's a false understanding in the minds of some people who think that somehow if all of a sudden these loved ones disappear off the face of the earth, I'll understand and I'll agree that Jesus came for them and then I'll bow the knee and put my faith in Jesus. And my words to them is that at that point, I believe it will be too late. Because the God who has been drawing the Holy Spirit, who has been convicting the love of Christ that's been there for you to see is no longer at work. In fact, the very opposite, the scripture says, is at work where God is sending to them a working error that leads them not to believe. How important is it then, if you've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be saved today? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. My friends, if you're hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, you desperately need to place your faith and trust in Christ today while you still have the opportunity. You're sharing your faith with others that are lost, where the God of this world seems to just have blinded their minds. They, They don't see it or they don't want to see it. How critical it is for them to come to Christ while there's still opportunity to do that. To presume upon the grace of God is a deadly, deadly error. Paul is not implying that those who are dying without Christ are the unlucky victims of predestination to damnation. We studied all those Calvinistic terms when I was in school. I remember the one, supralapsarianism. I don't know why I still remember that. That means double predestination. God said, some go to heaven and some go to hell. You had lapsarians and super lapsarians and people just trying to figure it all out. And all I can tell you is that now is the time of salvation. Place your faith in Christ while you may. And be absolutely consumed with those who you have shared faith with who to this point are refusing the gospel of Jesus Christ. In verse 13 or verse 11, when he says, for this reason, understand what the reason is. 
The reason is, is because they did not receive the love of the truth. And why didn't they receive the love of the truth? The reason is, go down there to verse 12, and at the end of verse 12, they didn't believe the truth because they were taking pleasure in wickedness. They enjoy that whole concept of, well, I can do what I want to do and sin without impunity. You see, the problem is that's not how it works. There is always, always going to be a consequence to our actions. And people must come and place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Notice as we go down into this passage, we understand not only uh, the enemy, but we understand the reason for our joy. And Paul writes in verse 13, he says, but we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, be loved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through the sanctification by the spirit and faith of the truth. And so Paul is, is contrasting these who, who refuse because of their desire to live out life in the, the way that pleases their flesh. He is contrasting that group with a group that he says, God has had his hand in your life. Now, I believe that there is the working of God, but I also believe that the scriptures very clearly teach there's the will of man. If you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, you find that Adam and Eve had a choice to make, and they made the worst possible choice. And here we are understanding that we still have choices to make, don't we? We still have choices. I like the theology professor at my seminary who said, on the one hand, you have the working of God. It's like a straight line. And on the other side, you have a straight line that is the will of man. And somewhere along the line, they cross. And it's at that point of crossing that you have salvation where man has exercised faith in God. But salvation is, is absolutely impossible without man's desiring and placing his faith there, and God at work in his life. We don't know where those two lines cross. There's much we don't know. There's much we don't understand. And you can feel free to disagree with me if you like. But this I know. This is a point of comfort and strength for every single person that's placed their faith in Jesus Christ. God has a plan for our salvation, but he also has a plan for our sanctification. Notice here in this passage, he says, from the beginning, for salvation through sanctification. It was for this he called you through the gospel that you may gain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught. In addition to faith in Christ, Paul admonishes the Thessalonian believers to make certain that they're standing firm, that they're holding fast. Uh, the idea of, of standing there uh, is an intensive force. It probably goes all the way back to chapter 2, verse 2, where they were quickly shaken. And Paul says, don't be quickly shaken. He's telling them to be, be stable, and there needs to be that intense force there. Uh, they, they shouldn't get bounced around. This is a commitment that they've made to, to live a Christian life that's pleasing to the Lord. And then he says, hold fast to the traditions that you were taught. And literally, that means to exert strength, mental, physical strength. It speaks of literally taking a strong grip on these truthful teachings. If Paul was going to write this after the scriptures were compiled and the canon was closed, Paul would say to us today, hold fast the word of God. Hold fast onto the scriptural truths that are before you. Don't, don't let those go. How important it is that you hold on to those things. That you may, once you do that, experience the comfort of the Lord. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God the Father who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. There is tremendous comfort in knowing that I've placed my faith in Jesus Christ and my salvation is secure. It's not in me that I've merited salvation. I've done nothing good on my own to be able to say that I'm on my way to heaven. I have no comfort and strength in myself. 
My comfort and strength comes from Jesus Christ and the fact that I have a relationship with him through faith. He is my savior. And what a joy that is. I, I am so blessed to be saved. In fact, that is the, the core of everything that's important to me. It's all about being saved, is it not? And being able to have that faith. I, I, I don't know why we as Christians don't still get excited about sharing our testimony and how we came to place our faith in Christ. If you're here today and you've placed your faith in Christ, I don't care what's going on in your life, nothing compares to the fact that you have faith in Christ. You may be totally poor. You may be absolutely terminally ill. You may have a life that is topsy-turvy from the top down. You may be discouraged and depressed, but my friends, listen, if we have Christ, we have everything we need. There is a world that is dying without Christ, without hope. And we fail to celebrate our salvation. Oh, how blessed we truly are. Oh, how blessed. We never know when life is going to change for us. There are people who, who may be here today who are experiencing tremendous conflict in your soul. There may be a conflict going on. There may be tension in your heart. And God is at work today in your life. And you're yet to place your faith in Jesus. I can't implore you enough that today you might place your faith in Jesus. Because if the rapture was to take place, and it's imminent, you would lose that opportunity to place your faith in Christ. No one here knows when our last breath is going to be. Not one of us knows. Tell me if you know. You don't. I had an eventful week this week. I'm very thankful to the Lord, but I had an eventful week. I, I found it necessary to back my truck into my wife's car earlier in the week <laughs> as it sat in the driveway. <laughs> that, that, that felt good. My wife and I were, there, we were driving to pick the car up at, at, at the shop and uh, there was a three car little pile up in Route 50. And my wife said, boy, it's the grace of God if we don't get in an accident sometime. And I said, yeah, you're right. Hour later, I'm coming across an intersection in Annapolis where there's six lanes of traffic. I'm sitting there at the red light minding my own business and the green arrow came on. That means you can proceed. <laughs> And so I started to proceed to take a left turn, and out of the corner of my eye, when I got about halfway across, I noticed that that lane was open and there was a Chevy Blazer barreling down on me. And I thought to myself, this isn't going to be good. All I saw was this woman's face as she had her hands on the wheel went, <laughs> I thought, that's not good. <laughs> that's not good at all. And so I pressed on my gas pedal to try to see if I could get past her, and fortunately, she didn't hit my door. She was doing 40, 45 miles an hour. And she hit just behind my driver's door. And the inertia, instead of taking the full impact, spun the truck around. And then the truck's in great shape. <laughs> um, I looked at the wheels and the back wheels were up underneath where they're not supposed to be. And yeah. And she was okay. That was good news. She wasn't hurt. And I walked away. It was fine. You know, just all in a day. And I thought, Lord, thank you for letting me see that and hitting the gas so it didn't hit my door because it could have been quite a bit different. And I'm just reminded at how quick life can change for us all. Some of you have been in terrible car wrecks. It's changed your life. We don't know when our last breath is going to be. Amen. We need to have a sense of urgency about the spiritual future that awaits us all. We think we have time, but we don't know that. And there are people, according to the verse 11, that will having made a choice 
to push and reject the truth of the gospel away. Will after that rapture never have another opportunity to place their faith in Christ. That should concern us here today. Because we all know people who fit that description. And how our hearts need to be motivated to share the love of Christ more than they really are. I find it comforting to know that I have my faith in Christ. That if that car had hit me and it was different and I woke up in glory, I'm okay with that. But not everyone has that assurance. Not everyone has that comfort and draws from that strength. Let's just take a moment to bow our heads at this time. And what I'd ask you to do this morning, if you know Christ, maybe you'd just spend a moment thanking the Lord for working in your heart and life. Thank Him for allowing you the opportunity to place your faith in Him. Giving you the opportunity to make a choice. Giving you a will. And maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm, I'm conflicted in my heart. There's a, there's a battle that's going on in my heart. And I'm not settled at all. I implore you to turn your life to Christ and place your faith in him. Maybe you're here this morning and say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me as we close in prayer. God's at work in my life. But I haven't put my faith in Jesus yet. I know he's working. I'm being convicted but I'm struggling with it. Is there anyone, anyone at all, just slip up your hand and say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. God's at work in my life. Thank you, thank you. Would you all stand with me, please? We'll have a word of prayer together. Father, we give you thanks today for the joy that we have because Christ is our source of strength. Father, how I pray that you might do a mighty work in our lives. Help us, Lord, who have placed our faith in Jesus to be so thankful, to understand the, the source of strength and joy, which is truly the person of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior. Amen. Lord, may you work in hearts and lives here today, those who are conflicted, those who are thinking, Lord, uh, about the future, how I pray, Lord, that you'd minister as only the Holy Spirit of God can do today. Give us a week, Lord, where we're truly reflecting salt and light into the world. Help us, Father, to be realistic and accurate ambassadors for you, that we might please you as we live these days. And may we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.